It is our great pleasure to have Professor John Bowers in our workshop today. Professor Bowers, welcome. To start with this interview, can you briefly introduce yourself and tell us about your contribution to this integrated photonics? So I'm at East University of California at Santa Barbara, and I focus on laser integration with silicon photonics. So combining 3.5 materials and other exotic materials like lithium niobate on silicon to make advanced photonic integrated circuits. So what makes you passionate about this field? Can you tell us why you picked up integrated photonics are your choice? We have the opportunity now to, to make photonics much better by integrating intimately with electronics. By having the CMOS drivers intimately connected with the photonic drivers, it takes much less energy and works at much higher speeds. And equivalently, we can improve electronics, right? We can, by having photonic I.O., we can have much higher capacity connections to, to switching chips or GPU chips. And so I think it's a very exciting time that is going to drive very advanced photonics, very high levels of integration to achieve what's needed for the next generation of, of electronics. So what is your vision about the integrated photonics? Can you tell us your view on how the field will transform in the next five to 10 years? So the first extensive enablement of silicon photonics was with 100 gigabit uh, transceivers, primarily led by Intel. And now at 51 terabit switching chips, silicon photonics has really been intimately integrated with, with electronic chips, co-packaged chips. And so that now requires you know, 32 times that first one, right? So it's now 3.2 terabit transceivers. And uh, so it's, it's a chance to make a big impact on, on the electronic field. And obviously, you know, the next generation switching chips will be 100 terabit and then 200 terabit. And, and uh, I think photonics will enable continued expansion uh, along those directions, just because optical waveguides and optical fibers have such high capacity. I see. And how about the energy loss? Can you comment on that as well? Yeah, that's a really good point. You know, currently about half the power of a, of a big chip goes to drive in the I.O. lines. And the problem is that, you know, it's just a capacitor, right? And so the longer it is, the more charge you have to have to charge up and discharge that, the more energy it takes. In contrast, photonics, once you emit the photon, it doesn't matter whether it goes 10 microns or 10 kilometers. It's the same amount of energy. So now we have the capability to transmit high amounts of data in, over a much wider region without having any excess you know, power loss that you get with copper interconnects today. So it's really going to revolutionize, I think, uh, high-speed communication. Between the bandwidth and energy loss, which do you think drives the technology moving forward? The drive is in both directions, right? Because w we need, particularly like with AI training and, and machine learning, we need much more capability than we have today. And so the, you know, the number of parameters that are being optimized in these deep learning models is just growing very, very fast. And so we need much higher capability than we have today. But also, it can't scale, right? It, it already takes huge carbon footprint just to do one, one training. And uh, if we don't make it 100, 1,000 times more efficient, it really isn't sustainable. So uh, both vectors, I think, are important and critical. And what is your view on the current status of the technology and the industry? Well, we're just at the tip of the iceberg. We're just beginning, right? So, you know, we have 100 gigabit transceivers, but they've been pluggables because the reliability was not good enough. And by integration, we can make them much more reliable than they are today. Uh, and the cost is way too high. So again, by integration, we can get much more capacity, much, much, many more bits for the same cost, right? Because in the end, it's all sort of limited by packaging cost. And so high levels of integration, you know, much beyond where we are today uh, will enable much higher yields, much better performance, and much lower cost. So, you know, there is a photonic Moore's law, just like the electronic Moore's law. And, you know, we're, we're just at the beginning of that, where it may be a thousand devices integrated on, on a chip. And I think before long, it'll be a million. What do you think the role between academia and the industry? And in particular, what kind of role do you think applied materials can play in this field? Well, I think universities are good at, at sort of the breakthroughs, at demonstrating the ideas. And so like in our case, we demonstrated this heterogeneous integration of 3-5 gain on silicon, and, and that was the first silicon laser. And then, but you know, Intel completely 
uh, drove that whole commercialization, and now they're making you know millions of transceivers a year, and it's a billion dollar business, and it takes hundreds of problems being solved to get to that point. And so you really need sort of the breakthrough research, but also you need the very careful process development. And again, that's where applied materials fits in because the, the process control with modern tools in a modern CMOS line is just phenomenal. And uh, that's actually really necessary to make photonics work because photonics are sensitive to such small changes in dimension. And so it's really critical to have incredible process control. You know, integrating three fives onto silicon was key to getting gain. Uh, but similarly, integrating lithium nabate onto there is key to making you know nonlinear devices and Pockel's effect and second harmonic generation. And I think we'll see a lot of applications, you know, AR, VR, LiDAR that require, you know, uh, a wide range of wavelengths. And uh, so by using nonlinear devices, we can take these superb telecom devices and and double or triple in, into the visible as example, which is really important for AR, VR. In your presentation, we heard that you're working on a wide variety of materials, including silicon and silicon nitride waveguides, 3 5 materials, and even lithium niobate. Can you comment a little more about how materials engineering can play the role to push the integrated photonics technology moving forward? Well, you know, most breakthroughs come from materials breakthroughs, right? So originally, the breakthrough of, of developing gallium nitride for visible light emission, which led to Suji Nakamura's Nobel Prize, led to the whole field of solid state lighting happening, right? And, and similarly, the, the original breakthrough of, of gallium arsenide lasers led to the whole fiber optics field and, and optical communication rather than what was before, which was you know, microwave based. Uh, so again, the ability to put lithium nabate, thin film lithium nabate on silicon, the ability to put three fives on silicon allows us to get additional functionality in a very highly developed, highly controlled process flow in a CMOS facility. Well, it is really encouraging and inspiring to hear that the materials engineering is the key driver for the advancement of the integrated photonics. Thank you very much, Professor Bowers, for joining us today and for this inspired talk. Thank you. Yep, thank you. I enjoy the conference. Yes, thank you. So.